We're on a mission. We invite you to dream, to pray, to discern, to envisage what it is that God is calling you to do and be for His kingdom. What's the vision of our future that beckons or draws us forward? For every single one of us, every day of the week, whatever we find ourselves doing, we are open for business as servants of the Lord. Welcome to Hamilton Central Baptist Church's program for the 13th of September. We're so glad that you can join us. Well, th these really are unusual days that we're living in, right? I mean, th this time last year, we'd never have predicted what the year 2020 would be like. But we've done really well as a nation in, in coping with and, and curbing the spread of COVID-19. And of course, our hearts and our prayers go out to the other nations of the world where the spread of this nasty little virus is raging. But we human beings, we're a resilient lot. We adapt, we flex, we find new ways of doing things. And I guess that's never truer than for the Christian church. I mean, for health and safety reasons, we haven't been free to meet as we normally would. But the, the church of Jesus Christ is as active as ever. And we're finding new ways, innovative ways to express our community and to share the love of Jesus. Well, we're looking again at the church today and how it might best be understood. The popular perception of church is it's about buildings and programs. But, but actually, it's much simpler than that. It's about ordinary people, just like us, who have found a, a sense of hope in renewed relationship with God. We, or you, are the church. What is the church? Is the church a building? Is the church a pastor? Or the staff? Is the church the music? The tradition? Or the ministries? These are all good things, but they are not the church. Take them away, and the church is still here. Why? Because you are still here. The church is you. The church is you with a purpose. The church is you on a mission. The church is you with a plan, a simple plan to plug into God at a weekend service, to charge up in a small group community, to live out using your gifts and passions, and to pass on your faith to those who do not know Christ. When you and I live like this, all the things we used to do in church become things we do as the church. God desires it. The world needs it. And we are called to be it. What is the church? The church is you. We're continuing on in our series of studies through the book of Acts. Last week, we looked at how the apostles began to face persecution for preaching about Jesus in the first part of Acts chapter 4. This gave us an insight into what it was like to be a Christian within the society at large in first century Jerusalem. In the passage that we're going to look at today, we gain an insight into what it was like to be on the inside of that earliest Christian community. Acts chapter 4, starting at verse 32. 
All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God's grace was so powerfully at work within them that there were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field that he owned, and he brought the money, and he put it at the apostles' feet. You've possibly heard the story of the new minister who got up to speak on his first Sunday and delivered a really powerful message, and the people were very enthusiastic about their new pastor, and they remarked how they had made a, a great choice. Well, the next Sunday, when he got up to preach, the people waited with enthusiasm for the word of the Lord to be delivered to them. However, the minister read the same text that he'd preached on the previous Sunday, and, well, by and large, he preached exactly the same message. Well, the people were a little puzzled, but they figured maybe he'd had a busy week and wasn't able to prepare a new message. Well, the next Sunday came around and the minister read from the same text again and he preached the same message for a third time. When it happened on the fourth Sunday, the elders took him aside and said, hey, what's going on? To which the minister replied, well, you haven't done what I said the first Sunday, so I thought I'd keep preaching it until you do and then I'll go on to something else. If you've been tracking with us in this series of studies through the book of Acts, you you might actually be forgiven for a sense of deja vu about the verses that we've just read. I mean, didn't we look at something like this just uh, a few weeks back in Acts chapter 2? I mean, these verses at the end of Acts chapter 4 are very similar to a passage at the end of Acts 2 in terms of describing what it was like to be part of the initial Christian community. Uh, Both passages are a little bit like a window through which we can take a peek at what it meant to follow Jesus in those early days of the church. And as we've we've noted before, passages like the one that we're looking at today describe Christianity or the church in its purest form. The church and the Christian community of which it was comprised, that these are closest to the movement that Jesus began, both chronologically and and also in concept, that these verses describe normal Christianity. By contrast or implication, what we know of Christian faith and life and community today might be best described as, well, somewhat subnormal. the, the, The popular concept or the perception of the church today is kind of caricatured as largely an archaic institution. It's, it's formal and ritualistic. Whereas in those days, it was more of a living organism. Uh, to most people today, the word church simply means a building. In, in those days, the word church referred to a people uh, called out of typical lifestyles to live in a distinctly different way. The church today is largely regarded as old-fashioned and irrelevant, a hangover from a conservative past and really only for those with a religious bent or those who are weak and in need of a crutch. In those days, the church was vibrant and exciting. The power of God was a living reality. People were being touched and healed and transformed. They may not have always been liked or approved of, But the church was a place of, well, electric excitement. So how might we understand or describe them? And and what are some of the contrasts between their era of being church and ours? There are probably many more than these, but let me suggest four features of this initial Christian church that we might want to consider applying to our context. And the first is that I want to mention is that they were in unity. Now, verse 32 says that all the believers were one in heart and mind. Well, well, as principles of Christian community go, the importance of this is not something that we should underestimate. 
and we could easily gloss over it. They were people who shared a common commitment to the same goal. Their ambitions, we might say, were aligned. They were heading in the same direction rather than following individual or separate agendas. And the common focus of their unified life together was the mission that Jesus had left them to fulfill, spreading the good news of Jesus to all creation, making disciples of every nation and people group in the world. Well, the Bible actually has a lot to say about the value of unity amongst God's people. Uh, Unity is presented in the scriptures as an imperative. It's not an optional extra for those who want to and you don't really have to. For for instance, the gospel authors Matthew, Mark and Luke, each of them record that famous statement that Jesus made when religious leaders were accusing him of working for the devil. Every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined and every city or household divided against itself will not stand. So unity and commitment to a common vision is essential. Then in in John chapter 17, there's a a passage that we often refer to as Jesus' high priestly prayer. Uh, It was the night that Jesus was arrested and tried, and in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus prayed for his disciples and those who will form the church in years to come, which includes you and I. This is how he prays. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I've given them the glory that you gave me that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me so that they may be brought to complete unity. And then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. So we we cannot underplay the significance of unity and being one in heart and mind in Jesus' ambition for his church. Our expression of unity, Jesus said, would actually be an evangelistic mechanism by which people would understand the Father's strategy in sending Jesus into our world. Then the psalmist David wrote these famous words in Psalm 133. How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. It's like precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down upon the collar of his robes. It's as if the Jew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion. For there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life evermore. When the Apostle Paul wrote his letter to the Ephesian church, this is how he encouraged them in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 3. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. So being in unity or being one in heart and mind is God's instruction to the church. Lack of unity is therefore, well, sinful. It's like the opposite of God's values. But what does that really mean? I mean, unity, of course, doesn't mean uniformity. To be in unity does not mean being the same or liking everything the way everyone else does. Uh, How boring that actually would be. I mean, to be in unity doesn't mean we all wear the same colored clothes or uniform. Or unity is not to be a clone of the pastor. Now, there's a scary thought. Within unity, there's ample room for diversity and varying convictions. Unity in the church is not about being identical. Unity in the church is about being committed to the same vision. It's about heading in the same direction and holding a common vision of the same big picture of what God wants to do in and through his church. Perhaps what destroys unity more than anything else is when people have set personal agendas that they're inflexible over. Disunity happens when people elevate their personal opinions and convictions and preferences above those of everybody else. They, They demand that the church do things their way. 
Now, disunity in the family of God is, well, it's almost always the byproduct of selfishness and stubbornness. People don't want to entertain change or ideas that would differ from past traditions or personal experience. And as a consequence, well, they can become critical of the church. They say it no longer meets their needs. Now, unity or being one in heart and mind, that, that happens when people hold a light grip on personal agendas. In contrast to stubbornness and selfishness, there's a higher commitment to what will help the church achieve its goals more effectively. Well, well the group of Christ followers described here in Acts chapter 4 had a good grasp on the overall mission of the church. They uh, were expected by Jesus to produce spiritual fruit in terms of new converts. They were to make disciples, to grow numerically to the point where every nation in the world uh, would hear the good news and have it proclaimed amongst them. Petty, personal agendas about what the church could or should be like were put to the side in favor of commitment to the overall objective. I, I once pastored a church where a fermenting conflict existed amongst a, a group of women in the church over the color of the wallpaper in the church kitchen. This all happened at a time when Liz and I had just returned from our first visit to Bangladesh, which at the time we were there was recovering from the worst floods in recorded history up to that point. We'd just been wading through you know, flood-engulfed streets with human excrement around us and refuse and oil and so on, and we came home and, well, this was the most important issue on the minds of God's people, the color of the wallpaper in the church kitchen. Now, the, the interesting thing to note about unity is that its maintenance is the responsibility of every member of the church. Nothing undermines unity in the family of God like, well, the unchecked tongue. We each have potential, right, to destroy unity by the casual word here or there that criticizes or malines others. And we are responsible too, not only for what we say to others, we're actually also responsible in what we let others say to us. Now, there are two sides to the malicious gossip coin. Both the teller and the hearer are actually guilty of sin. Now, to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace, as Paul put it, there are times when we need to stop those who malign others and, well, encourage them to see the people that they have a grievance against personally. A unity in vision and purpose, this is crucial for the church of Jesus Christ to achieve its potential. We all have a part to play, and we need to align our lives and our ambitions around the main thing that God is asking of his followers. And the main thing about the main thing is that we keep the main thing the main thing. Now, then secondly, they shared their resources. Well, you might want to check your seatbelt is securely fastened at this point, because verse 32 says, no one claimed that any of his possessions was his own, but they shared everything they had. I mean, th this was the practical, tangible outworking of their love for each other and an expression of their sense of unity. Uh, when it came to personal possessions and chattels and wealth, well, they actually had the attitude, what's mine is yours. Help yourself. It's there to be used. They didn't so much regard themselves as owners of their property with exclusive use and rights, Rather, they were stewards or administrators of what now technically belonged to God. Having Jesus as Lord and manager of their spiritual lives, well, that was also translated into his lordship or management over their temporal physical affairs as well. The, the, the situation that's described here did not mean that they gave everything they owned to the church and it was all stored in a huge big warehouse where you could come and help yourself when you needed it. But there are some people who have actually tried to infer that that's the definition of Christian community that's been described here. It, it, it's not that. No, the, the implication is that they retained legal ownership of their possessions, 
but they made them available for others to use as they had need. There wasn't a selfish, isolationist attitude that said, you know, these things are mine, you save up and buy your own. It was more one of a a loving community and a sharing with uh, the attitude that said, well, if I have something that you need, then I willingly give you liberty to use it. I, I wonder what the implications of this principle might be for the church in our day and age. I mean, how, how do we feel about other people using our possessions? What about the risk that they may break them or misuse them or blunt them or crash them? Th- this kind of expression of Christian community really does fly in the face of a lot of popular stewardship theory in our culture today. And I guess it raises the uncomfortable question, how much do we love our brothers and sisters in Christ? Because love involves both risk and trust. These first century believers were more than willing to risk the loss of what they owned or to trust their brothers and sisters in Christ with any and all of their worldly goods. After all, they didn't regard themselves as exclusive owners in the first place. Now that Jesus was Lord of their lives, everything they used to regard as their own now belonged to him. You know, over the years, I've been a part of churches that have sought to put this principle that's outlined in this passage into practice in the form of things like a shared resources catalog where uh, individuals or families uh, identify things like tools or property or assets or finance that can be made available to others and they've recorded them in a kind of a categorized database, things like tools that can be shared around or baby furniture that's no longer needed or clothing or skills or short-term finance, babysitting availability and so on and so on. When people have need, they simply contact the database coordinator who identifies where or who such resources are available from and contact numbers are passed on. Maybe that's an idea whose time has come for our church community. But to be sure, there's risk involved in the kind of things like this. These first-generation believers discovered a depth of relationship with each other that was hugely dynamic. They learned to let go of what was theirs, and instead, it all became ours. The third thing that we could note is that they understood the need for systems and organization in the church. Now, I'm referring here to verses 34 and 35, where it says that there were no needy persons among them, for from time to time those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. Luke goes on to describe, in fact, an example of this kind of sharing where where Joseph, also known as Barnabas, sold some land and gave it to the needy. Well, you might be asking, what has this got to do with organization in the church? Well, it, it actually represents the development of systems and infrastructure amongst this first or prototype community of believers. For if we go back to Acts chapter 2, Luke records, as we've noted, the similar account of how the believers shared with those who were in need out of their resources. Verse 44 of Luke 2 says, All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. And then two chapters on, in chapter 4, Luke records a similar practice. However, a significant difference between these two passages is the means in which the money was distributed. In Acts chapter 2, those who had excess simply gave it to the needy people themselves. As a person saw someone else in need, they responded to it. However, in Acts chapter 4, it says that they brought the money to the church and laid it at the apostles' feet, and the apostles distributed it. And the implication is that these first-generation believers we're beginning to recognize the need for organization and systemic structure within the church in order to be able to fulfill its mission. When they were a small number, there wasn't the need for structures and organization of church affairs. But as they grew in size and they were growing rapidly, 
it would seem the need became much more apparent. As more and more people came into the church, it became impossible for everyone to know who was in need and who wasn't. There were just so many people. Therefore, the apostles were entrusted with the distribution of these resources. Same principle of sharing out of excess, but the means of doing so was facilitated. Uh, There's a school of thought that suggests today uh, the critical of structure and means of organization in the church. There's resistance to coordination and systems of doing things. Uh, When it comes to things like like giving or sharing resources with the needy, they, they would just rather hang loose and, well, give as they feel sovereignly prompted by the Lord. And to a certain extent, I don't have too much problem with that. The New Testament never muzzled the idea of Christians responding to others in need as God made them aware. However, the New Testament also models the concept of God's people organizing themselves and having systems by which the church's ministry is most effectively fulfilled. The Christian church and its mission, it's not an amorphous, shapeless mass that just happens along by chance. While we might like to describe the church as a living organism uh, rather than as an institution, organisms still need to be organized. That These believers exercised a measure of trust in their leaders to administer funds wisely. As the church developed under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, weekly collections began to be taken up to accumulate funds for the work of the ministry. Special funds were soon established to help the practical needs of widows and orphans and to support the ministry of those who taught the scriptures. Now, I'm sure people still gave individually to certain needs that the Lord prompted them to follow through on, but they also gave to the church coffers, for want of a better term, and the apostles, the leaders of the church, distributed that money as the needs determined. In their attitude, the people gave to God, and by their process, they would bring money to the church, and the church distributed it to the most needy causes. And then fourthly and finally, normal Christianity is extremely attractive to people outside of the church. I mean, to become a Christian in those days, it was not just taking on board a series of beliefs about God. It wasn't an an admission pass into heaven when you die. Being Christian also wasn't merely a personal or just an individual thing between one person and God. But being a follower of Jesus actually meant belonging to a community of people who were really committed to you and to your welfare in life. They didn't just talk about the love of God for people in need. They did something about it. That there were no needy people amongst them. Think about that. Excess land was liquidated and surplus assets shared with people who were in need. To be a follower of Jesus in those days was to belong to a community of people who really took care of you. Why? Because they couldn't bear to see people in need while they had more than they actually needed themselves. In their view of the kingdom of God, why should I have luxury and comfort in the splendor of my wealth when my brother down the road cannot meet his mortgage payments this month or feed his family? I mean, this was the degree to which these people loved the family of God. They wanted to share. Well, the, the implication is that people in Jerusalem began to notice what it was like to belong to this group of people called Christians. Their community life actually challenged the values and the paradigms of their society. And as a result, more and more people were attracted to Christ. Which again raises for me the question, what is it about the modern Christian community that challenges the paradigms of our society? In, in, in what ways are we really radical as a community of believers? Well, well, I want to suggest that 
If we are ever to become radical in our day and age, it might just be in the realm of our economic welfare. When the Christian community in the 21st century starts selling its excess property and redistributing wealth that we claim actually belongs to God, not to us anymore, well then our society may well sit up and listen. In closing, let me throw out an idea as a teaser. I have a Christian friend, an accountant, who came up with an idea along the lines of these verses. He suggested that what if the church was to form itself into clusters of, say, six families? And then within those clusters, each family or household would establish a budget for their needs as they personally determined them to be. So there could be a variety, not a standard list of values and and the forming of that budget. But they agreed to give surplus income that they earned into a common pool that would pay off the mortgages of other members of their cluster. Uh, There would obviously be a variation of income and different types of budget needs that families had. Well, my friend went on, he said, let's say that they started to pay off the largest of the mortgages within their individual cluster out of the accumulated group surplus income. He calculated that after maybe two or three years, that largest of the mortgages would probably be repaid. Well, at that point, the particular family whose mortgage had just been paid down, all of that money that they formerly paid to meet their mortgage within their established budget, that was now surplus to their budget, and the group would then apply a now increased surplus to the next largest mortgage, which might, say, take approximately 18 months to clear. Then their regular mortgage repayments would become surplus to their budget and the accumulated surplus would increase in size again. The same process was applied to the next largest mortgage and then the next one after that and the next one and so on. And according to my friend's calculations, after approximately just six years, all the mortgages in that cluster of families would be repaid. Now you imagine how the expression of Christian community in the Church of Jesus Christ would challenge, probably really upset the financial institutions in our materialistic society. I wonder who might be interested in finding out more about Jesus if we were living and caring for one another like that.
And on that day when my strength is failing, the end draws near and my time has come. Still my soul will sing your praise unending. Ten thousand years and forever. Our loving Father, we come today expressing our grateful thanks for the lovely peach tree that I'm standing by. It's so beautiful, as is so much of your creation. Thank you, Father, we praise your name. And Father, we thank you for the church family that makes use of this property. Father, some of them are sad some of them are near the end of their life. And Lord, we bring them before you and ask that your comfort and your mercy will be theirs. Father, we thank you that you have brought so many young people into our church and we pray for them. We ask for the littlies, for those who go to school and those who go on to tertiary education. Father, Give them purpose in life. Give them a vision of what they can do for you. So, Father, we bring these things before you, knowing that you are our loving Father, that you will hear and answer our prayers according to your mind and will. For Christ's sake, Amen. I have a very young family and I want to encourage you at the next referendum to say no nope to dough. Kia ora, I'm Pane Kafia from Ngāti Poro. I would encourage you to vote no nope to dough. The greatest risk to New Zealand is that this will in fact open Pandora's box and that more cannabis will be produced and sold than ever before. The government can't control pokey machines and liquor stores in our communities. How the hell are they going to control cannabis? I'm saying nope to dope to protect our whakapapa. Our mokupuna, tamariki and rangatahi deserve better. We're not talking about Woodstock weed or your parents' pot. Cannabis is now much more potent. It's a harder drug. It's a dab. It's an edible. It's a vape. Let's not go there. Because we know that the cannabis industry is going to go after the most vulnerable communities. This is a real social justice issue. And we've got to do all we can to keep our children, young people and our families safe. In my work as a counsellor, I see firsthand how cannabis addiction is destroying many lives, particularly among those who are in vulnerable communities. I've seen the children of dope smokers grow up to smoke dope and worse. This will destroy uh, a lot of people and especially uh, the future generation of this beautiful nation. I've seen young people have their motivation, energy, joy robbed from them by dope. It is a recreational escape which produces diminished accuracy of observation, memory, reasoning and sound judgment. I'm really concerned about the mental health issues we have in New Zealand. I've seen many patients develop psychotic illness after smoking dope. Legalising marijuana for recreational use will simply add to this problem. It certainly has a, a killer punch. As we're booting out big tobacco, let's not put out the welcome mat for big marijuana. I want my family to grow up in a risk-free, safe environment from cannabis. That's why I'm challenging you, encouraging you to vote nope to dope. Vote nope. Vote nope. Vote nope. Vote nope. 
for goodness sake, vote no to dope. Please vote no to dope. So at the next referendum, don't take the risk, vote no. Here's a few things that are coming up in the life of our church that we'd love you to join us for. Well, if you're watching this program uh, before 7 p.m. on Sunday the 13th of September, you'll, you'll be aware that we're running our cannabis debate tonight. Well, unfortunately, COVID-19 gathering restrictions means that this event has had to be limited to 100 people, and we've been asking those planning to attend to register their place beforehand. But, but if you missed out on that, we do plan to live stream it, and links for this will be on our website. On Sunday the 4th of October, our church is hosting for the Churches of Hamilton a Meet the Candidates event. Uh, we'll have all the candidates for the two Hamilton electorates here, and it'll be a great chance to hear firsthand from those who are vying for our votes in the upcoming general election. Well, th this event is obviously free of charge, and there will be opportunity for people to text in their questions uh, for the respective candidates. Well, we did this three years ago, and it was a huge success. So do plan now to come and join with us. Then on Wednesday, the 14th of October, the annual Hamilton Prayer Breakfast uh, will be held at Hamilton Gardens. We'd love you to join with a contingent from our church that will be attending. Uh, this will be a, a great opportunity for people from uh, across the body of Christ to come together and to pray for our city and also for the general election that will happen just a few days later. Uh, as well as an opportunity to pray, there'll also be a lovely catered breakfast and if you come as part of HCBC's pre-purchased tables, uh, the cost is only $20 a head. Contact the church office and let us know if you'd like to come as part of our team. Well, thanks for joining with us again today. Uh, do watch news for government announcements as to when and how we can gather as a church community in the upcoming weeks. We'll also do our best to keep you up to date via email and on our church website. If or when COVID gathering restrictions are lifted to level one, we'll resume our regular services at 33 Charlemont Street uh, like we always have. If we do stay at level two for some reason, we'll keep producing these programs and our on-site gatherings will be limited to a maximum of 100 people. So whether or not we're physically meeting together, the work and the ministries of our church continue. And if you'd like to give to the Lord's work through the ministries of our church, do go to the HCBC website and click on that red button and follow the links. God bless you, stay safe, and we look forward to when we can be together again. And in the meantime, despite our circumstances, may these words from the Apostle Paul to the Philippian Christians guard our hearts. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus.